This lecture is about the modern period, and we're beginning with uh, Igor Stravinsky. Uh, just to give you an idea of what's happening in this modern period, which we actually have just discussed Debussy and uh, Wagner and all of those from uh, the Impressionist period and also the Romantic uh, period. Now we start to notice in this modern period there were characteristics that we can associate with these composers that we're gonna come up with. Um, dissonance, atonality, rhythmic complexity. What's really interesting about this is, is that we actually have had um, insight into the dissonance, atonality, and rhythmic complexity through the comp some of the composers that we have just studied. Um, and, but now during this time period, we see that there is an overtness of dissonance, atonality, and rhythmic complexity that we did not see in the period before this. Um, when we're talking about Igor Stravinsky, it's really interesting because he does mirror a lot of these elements in his music. Uh, his dates were 1882 to 1971. And when we talk about his three stylistic, st uh, his three uh, stylistic um, characteristics, we actually look at it in his three periods. His early career to 1919, and that's the part that we're actually going to be seeing the ballets from. Um, he works with Russian folk idioms and nationalistic influences. Whereas when he gets to 1919 to 1954, he starts to go to a neoclassical period in his life where he's using forms from the past, but he's using the dissonance, atonality, and rhythmic complexity of his period. And last but not least, the 1954 to 1968, he delves into serialism, which is a form of atonality based on the systematic ordering of the 12 notes of the chromatic scale. the 12 notes in the scale, that what we notice is, is that before this time, basically in tonality, you're always coming back to one particular note, which could actually create the tonality, sometimes with the dominant being a secondary note that we use a lot in our, our tonal pieces. And now we notice that all 12 notes are actually uh, used before you use them again. So therefore, there's like this equality amongst the pitches, so it kind of generates more of an, what we consider to be an atonality. So we notice that they're the, the stylistic characteristics of uh, Stravinsky's three periods. Just to give you a little bio on Stravinsky, he actually came from St. Petersburg. His father was a bassist in the Tsar's Imperial Opera. He studied law at Saint, in St. Petersburg, and he privately studied with Rimsky-Korsakov. And you remember Rimsky-Korsakov as being one of the Russian five that ends up teaching at the conservatory, but he actually studied privately with Rimsky-Korsakov. Um, he had two wives. Uh, one was initially his mistress, four children, and he had affairs with Ravel, Audrey, Rimsky-Korsakov's son, and Belgian composer Maurice Delage. Uh, Robert Kraft was his personal assistant, um, and we have today a lot of his diaries and dialogues um, with Stravinsky, which is very important to us because we get a chance to actually hear Stravinsky, and one of the assignments will be to actually go and listen to Stravinsky on YouTube. Um, at the end of his life, he did become an American citizen. So the two works that we're going to be looking at are the two ballets, The Firebird and The Rite of Spring. Firebird was the ballet in 1910. It was performed by the, Diago, uh, by the Ballet Russe under Diaghilev. The choreographer was Michel Fokin. The storyline is Prince Ivan. He goes down to the forest and he has, notices there's a spell on these 13 princesses. And he finds a firebird and he goes to shoot it, but then of course he, um, the firebird asks um, for her life. And at that point, uh, Prince Ivan um, the, spares the firebird, and the firebird gives him a magic feather, which he will use because those 13 princesses are under the evil spell of uh, Kaschai, an evil magician. And so what's going to happen in this um, ballet is, is that Prince Ivan is going to find the vulnerability of Kaschai, and that is that his immortality is in an egg that, that Prince Ivan finds, destroys, and with the help of the firebird, the 13 princesses are freed. I would like you to listen to that very final, beautiful um, scene 
where um, the Firebird theme is prevalent and it keeps repeating itself and it cha almost changes color with the instrumentation and the orchestration even though it's the same tune over and over again. The other work that I would like you to, uh, to look at, especially the final scene again, is the Rite of Spring. The Rite of Spring, of course, was um, a picture of pagan Russia. It's the reason why it had that sense or flavor of primitivism. The girl dancing herself to death in sacrifice to the gods so that the spring would come. Um, what's interesting is, is that um, WC actually played a forehand version with uh, Stravinsky of this very famous Rite of Spring. Um, as a ballet, it was commissioned by Diaghilev for the Ballet Russe. Dijinsky um, was the choreographer. If you remember, Dijinsky was the choreographer of the WC um, Afternoon of the Fawn. The debut night of Par in Paris, May 29th, 1913, was um, a very interesting reception of the um, uh, Rite of Spring, and Stravinsky even recalls that first performance when he says that first performance was attended by a scandal and must be known to everyone. Strange as it may seem, however, I was unprepared for the explosion myself. The reactions of the musicians who came to the orchestra rehearsals were without an um, intimation of it, and the stage spectacle did not appear likely to precipitate a riot. Mild pro um, protest against the music could be heard from the very beginning of the performance. Then when the curtain opened on the group of not kneed and long braided Lolitas jumping up and down, the storm broke. Cries of, shut up, came from behind me. Um, I heard people screaming, be quiet, um, trying to quiet the, quell the crowd. Um, the uproar continued, however, and a few minutes later I left the hall in a rage. I arrived in a fury backstage when I saw Diaghilev switching the house lights on and off in the last effort to quiet the hall. For the rest of the performance, I stood in the wings behind Nijinsky, holding the tails of his jacket, while he stood on a chair shouting numbers to the dancers um, to help the dancers keep track of the steps as the commotion in the audience drowned out the sound of the orchestra. So this was quite uh, an event for the opening of the Rite of Spring. A couple of other things that I want you to also know that, um, and make note of when you're watching it is, is that the costumes, the pagan villagers, they had black wigs, tribal paint, and no expression on their faces. Um, the other thing is the opening bassoon line is in a very high register, was based on a folk tune from Lithuania. The music is repetitive, asymmetrical um, rhythms, percussive dissonances, polyrhythms, and polytonality. And I want you to note that the dance, when you're watching the dance, they're certainly not in the tutus of Tchaikovsky or the toe shoes and the tiaras. And what's really interesting is the very last chord spells dead. So I would like you to watch also the final part of the Rite of Spring in, uh, as a ballet on YouTube. So these two ballets are very, very important to the the, uh, the creative process of Igor Stravinsky and actually are part of the first period of his creative processes. <laughs>